<laughs> so is anyone here for the first time? I don't think you are. I don't think anyone is. So just that you know that if you do ask a question or comment or contribute, let's say, to this discussion, your voice will be recorded. Not your video. Only my mog gets on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're not comfortable with that, then you can write in the chat box. So feel free to do that. And now we have someone from Australia and it must be super late for you, Kaz. Oh my goodness. Or early, maybe in the morning. So we have people all the way from Hawaii, through America, through Europe and all the way to Australia. That's very cool. Anyway, we are now on page 96. And last week, we started talking about the bad and the good person. So in this chapter, it's called One's Own Good and the Good of Others. Um, the first little paragraph defines the fool and the wise person basically by the qualities that they have, you know, that they um, practice most often, let's say. And then the next one talks about the actions one does as a, either a good or a bad person. So again, remember, it's not such a moralistic statement. It's more of a statement around the kind of things, the kind of actions that are going to lead to the end of suffering and the kind of actions that are going to cause you to suffer a lot because nobody really fits into one or the other category. You know, people aren't that um, one dimensional. Is that right? One dimensional. We're actually incredibly um, conditioned in so many different ways and we never know what kind of karma is going to arise from time to time. So it's really about looking at the qualities, looking at the actions and noticing also the effect of those actions, not just on one another, but on whole communities. So this is where we're actually going beyond <clears throat> relationships of, say, spiritual teacher and student or friend with friend and into our relationships with the wider community and our impact that we may have there. So obviously it's a field for enormous goodness and also a field for harm, especially if unfortunately some communities may have scallywags at the head <laughs> who lead people astray. So we have to be really careful and know what we're looking for there. And um, if your intuition says that something's off, to heed that intuition. So obviously here we're talking about some of the extremes, <clears throat> but also it can help us to kind of figure out where we are somehow on that trajectory and make sure we're kind of headed more to the wholesome side. So I'm going to read out uh, some of this, which mirrors the part on the bad qualities, but today it's starting with the good, which I think is a little bit more uplifting actually. And although it seems the same as the previous subject, sometimes it can bring out different nuances. Um, and as ever, I would really like to encourage discussion and um, application to our lives. So anything you would like to reflect on this or ask about this or contribute in any way is very welcome. So you can either put up your hand at any time or wait until you're prompted. Either way, I'll come to you in due course. So we begin at the bottom of the page. And as usual, the Buddha's talking to the monastic community and he uses the word monks <laughs> just because they were probably the most senior members of the community there, simply because the male Sangha was ordained first. But really, that word is far more inclusive and it applies to anyone in the community who may have been listening at that time. I do believe there were probably bhikkhunis around most of the time and also lay people. So it does apply to us all. So I'll say community. A good person is possessed of good qualities. They associate as a good person. They decide as a good person. They counsel as a good person, speak as a good person, act as a good person, and holds views as a good person. And one gives gifts as a good person. And how is a good person possessed of good qualities? Here, a good person has faith, shame, and fear of wrongdoing. One is learned, energetic, mindful, and wise. That is how a good person is possessed of good qualities. So I'm immediately going to um, just discuss those words shame and fear of wrongdoing and say that they're translations of Hiri Otapa, which are the two guardians, in a sense, of virtue. So they don't really mean the kind of guilt-ridden shame and kind of self-berating shame that we might associate that word to mean uh, in the West. But I would 
prefer to translate that as a sense of um, moral conscience. I, I actually think conscience is a really good translation for that. It's something that gives you a sense of what's right or wrong, you know, and you, you don't feel good to do something unwholesome. It doesn't feel right. And this is something very, very instinctive, I think, you know, at least once we start to be aware of our bodies and minds and the way they work, we start to know what's the right thing to do in any given situation. We can tell if our intentions are a little bit um, mixed, you know, uh, we can try and lie to ourselves about it, but there's something in ourselves that just doesn't feel quite right. Our hearts can't quite settle. And I think that's what it really means here. And it's also, of course, that sense that can come up before an act or afterwards. Um, you know, some things that we do cause us to have a sense of regret. So regret is is different from guilt and shame. I think it's more, um, it's less self-centered. It's less self-referencing. It's more able to say, okay, so this action was not skillful, this action of body or speech. But that doesn't define me. I can change my action. I can improve it next time. I can let go. So, and the fear of wrongdoing, again, is not so much fear, but I'd like to talk about that as moral caution. So moral conscience, or even just conscience, and moral caution, or just caution, rather than fear. Because, yeah, we could have fear of the consequences, but it's not a very good motivating force to avoid things that harm. I think it's better to sort of think about this in terms of um, taking care, you know, and, and just pausing before we act, especially when we know we might, you know, something's not wholesome. So we can play with these words, but remember they are translations, so it's not the Pali, so we can kind of look at them and dig a bit deeper sometimes, especially if something seems a little bit confusing, then it's worth looking closely at. Oh, yeah. So Nikki says something really nice. It's our internal compass to show us when we're not acting in line with our values and beliefs. Yeah. Internal compass is lovely. I mean, our values and beliefs, yes, when they're really wholesome. Sometimes we might have slightly mistaken values and beliefs. So sometimes it might not be a bad thing to be, you know, off compass with certain values and beliefs. But hopefully the intent, I know that you mean the wholesome ones there. Um, and when they are really wholesome, we know when we've gone off track. We know when we could do better, right? When it's not really worthy of us. So that is how a good person is possessed of good qualities. So in the next one, how does a good person associate as a good person? Here, a good person has for their friends and companions, those ascetics and Brahmins who have faith, shame again or let's say uh, conscience and fear of wrongdoing or caution care not to do wrong who are learned energetic mindful and wise and that is how a good person associates as a good person so here we want to have friends who are equals in a sense yeah if we want to develop certain qualities it's very helpful to hang around with others who have those same qualities and how does a good person decide as a good person? Here, a good person does not decide for one's own affliction, for the affliction of others, or for the affliction of both. That is how a good person decides as a good person. Mm -hmm. I've left myself a little note in this book on that one, because here we're talking about does not decide for one's own affliction, not only others, right? or the affliction of both. And yet how often do we make choices knowing that they're not really good for us? <laughs> you know, we maybe don't intentionally want our affliction, but if we look at our choices, they're not actually going to support us. They're not actually going to be for our benefit in the longer run. We take on the extra work when we know it's a bit beyond our capacity, you know, or we kind of join in the inappropriate joke because at that moment fitting in is more important than actually saying, hmm, maybe we should stop here, you know, and we choose for our own affliction in this way. We might not think we're doing it, but it's really interesting, isn't it, when we become more aware about how our choices work. Linda says, I think of skillful regret as remorse. 
skillful regret as remorse for the impact. Now there's a little thing that's stopping me see it all. Not thinking about what the action makes me. I think of skillful regret as remorse for the impact. Now that's not thinking about what the action makes me. I'm not sure I'm reading that properly, but uh, I think I get where you're coming from, Linda. There's this little icon coming up and it's kind of covering up the comments, which is a bit annoying. Try and move it. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe you could say a bit more about that. Meaning having remorse for what harm that's created. Yeah. Not worrying about what I am because of it. Yes, exactly. Like taking responsibility for the behavior, certainly, because you can't say, well, there's no self, therefore, you know, I'm not responsible because that's not right either. But not seeing it as part of who you are, not seeing it as something kind of unchangeable and something that means something about your very worth as a human being. Um, but just learning to see this process of cause and effect, because if there's anything we could um, identify or wrongly misapprehend as an I, it's really this conditioned process. You know, it's a process of cause and effect that we take to be an I, right? So this is when we get wise about the causes and we start seeing, you know, that there is a process and we can kind of uh, put certain causes in place in that process that will then have different results. So in that way, we start to change this Paticca Samapada um, Pati Loam, which means it's continuing, to Anu Loam, which means it's going backwards, reverse order and uh, eventually digs up the delusion. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and Kerdwin says that really makes sense about the harm created. Yeah, because this is really the sort of central point of Buddhism. It's all about Buddha's interested in um, suffering and the cause of suffering and the end, right? If two things, suffering and the end. But when you know the cause, you also know the end. When you see the end, then you uproot to the cause. So they all go together. I know when I've done skillful means as my wisdom grows, but then when I do unskillful things, my wisdom fades. Hmm, that's nice, actually. That's a nice connection to make between virtue and wisdom. Yeah. And of course, this is temporary, right? And it's not really your wisdom. It's just the quality of wisdom at that time is weak. Yeah, because it doesn't have the foundation of sila. And also that sila should be a natural outcome of wisdom. You know, what's the point of wisdom if it doesn't ensue in kindness and, and you know, ways of behaving that actually support other beings and support oneself? What's the point? I mean, you can think, you know, all kinds of things, but if you're not actually living a life of benefit, then it doesn't really stand for much. You know? It's the qualities in our heart that matter, right? Especially when it comes to the time of our death. It'll be that general direction of wholesomeness that is your kind of refuge. Yeah. Any other comments that people would like to um, say? Because it rests my voice, if you say it in your lovely voice. It's mainly comments so far. So, okay, I shall continue. So how does a good person counsel as a good person? Here, a good person does not counsel for one's own affliction, for the affliction of others, or for the affliction of both. That is how a good person counsels as a good person. And how does a good person <clears throat> speak as a good person? Here, a good person abstains from false speech, from divisive speech, from harsh speech and from idle chatter. That is how a good person speaks as a good person. And of course, the opposite of those holds true as well, right? These are just the abstinences, but if you take away those, then the idea is that what remains is wholesome. But we can also use our speech in beautiful ways that actually bring up, bring people together, even bring people who are divided or you know in conflict together. So we're using our speech in order to create harmony. And then we abstain from harsh speech, we use gentle speech, we use lovable, agreeable speech. And in the suttas it says, speech that goes to the heart, that's worth recording. I missed out the false one there, that's quite clear, isn't it? If you're actually misrepresenting a situation or a fact or the truth, 
knowingly, you know, then this is false speech. So obviously that's a commitment to truth. And that can be taken, you know, from a kind of coarse level, just simply saying what's true to being really quite refined and speaking only about what we know to be true. And then from idle chatter. So this doesn't mean you can never have like a little laugh with your friends or something, you know, but I think it does sort of point towards keeping it a little bit in check and not allowing it to degenerate because sometimes it can start off a little bit of fun and after a while, at the very best, it makes us tired, right? And sometimes it just makes us kind of unmindful and uh, kind of model-minded. I like that phrase. That's also from the sort of, you know, mindlessness and model-mindedness. <laughs> So I find it also quite tiring because I have to meet a lot of people and I notice the difference in just, uh, I mean, not necessarily idle chatter, but even just talk about anything that's not directly concerned with the Dhamma, you know, is in some way, I mean, when it's about caring for the other, it's nice and it's nourishing, but there's nothing as energizing as talking about the Dhamma. You know, when, when I can talk about the Dhamma, suddenly I get this new burst of life. <laughs> which Linda knows I'm sure because <laughs> you've lived with me <laughs> and I'm like oh I've got time for that <laughs> yeah but of course a little bit of friendly chit chat is fine but I think the opposite of that is to speak uh, in a timely manner and to speak kind of with respect really for the other person's energy levels as well um, and what else does it say oh about idle chatter um, the opposite of idle chatter i think that one might be the one that goes to the heart but it's something really worth saying you know words that are worth recording worth preserving so that's about speech and then how does a good person act as a good person here a good person abstains from the destruction of life from taking what is not given and from sexual misconduct that is how a good person acts as a good person. So we included the speech already in there. And last week we pointed out that the uh, abstaining from intoxicants and drugs is not included, but this does not mean that it is okay. <laughs> Anybody who's trying to develop mindfulness will see the effect of that on the mind, even if you drink too much coffee. I mean, I'm only just getting into drinking a little bit of coffee, but if I have two cops, which is almost never, um, my energy just crashes completely um, and I don't feel really good. But it's not actually a, a, an intoxicant or um, a drug simply because it doesn't distort perception, whereas drugs and intoxicants tend to distort uh, the clarity of the mind. So how does a good person hold views as a good person? And this is quite an interesting one because this is talking about the preliminary level of right view that we should all kind of attempt to, um, to consider at the very least. Here, a person holds such a view as this. There is what is given, offered and sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is with this world and the other world. There is mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are good and virtuous aesthetics and Brahmins in the world who've realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. That is how a good person holds views as good person. So for those who were here last week, it's the same, only the opposite side of what we discussed last week. And um, even just reading this compared to reading the other one just feels so much more beautiful and so much more productive of qualities like gratitude to me. There is what is given, offered and sacrificed. You know, sometimes when people come to a monastery, this is a beautiful reflection to make that everything we eat here, you know, everything that we use, whether it's the heating <laughs> or it's the cushions that we sit on or just it's the roof over your head, you know, it's the cups that you hold in your hand. All of it has been offered by members of our community. There's nothing that's been bought by the monastic community because we don't hold money. We don't handle money. Nobody's gone out there and thought, I want this, I want that. Everything has come as a gift, not only to the monastic sangha, but to the monastic sangha for a purpose, which is to establish place, places of practice for everybody. 
so really everything that we use is a kind of holy item if you like so you know if you have a big cup make sure you fill it with really nice tea and see if you can finish it <laughs> but really it's just you know conducive isn't it to frugality to gratitude to simplicity and to really um taking care out of respect for those who have given yeah so there is what's given offered and sacrificed people have given something up to give us these things it's not that our supporters are all rich and well off you know sometimes they might be saving for a long time and then they have five pounds spare at the end of the month and they bother to go online and to make the donation you know even though they might have to even pay paypal some sort of fee for that and even though they might think it's not much but they still do that and it's really so touching when i see that people of every kind of means can contribute to this in some way or another you know, sometimes it's just the fact that you turn up for a talk and you smile and say words of encouragement. And I see that there are all these dedicated people like listening and learning the Dhamma. And that is really beautiful because you've sacrificed your time, right? You've sacrificed um, whatever defilements or greed or craving may have taken you in an opposite direction. You said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come to the Sutta discussion today. It's good for me. And it's good for everybody here to see everybody's, you know, interest and everybody's kindness in their face. So we sacrifice. There are the fruits and results of good and bad actions. Isn't it a relief? Imagine if you just did good stuff and it never had any effect for you or anyone else. It'd be so miserable. And obviously, if you thought there was no effect of bad actions, I mean, there's no reason to restrain so sometimes that's a useful doctrine for people that don't want to restrain or do good you know there is this world and the other world so this is directly about rebirth there is mother and father again we didn't come to be through our own effort it depended on others and those people did keep us alive like even if you know you may have been adopted or but still your mother would have put you up for adoption your father would have put you up for adoption so that you could have a chance at life there are beings who are reborn spontaneously who knows but it's giving us a, a hint and there are good and virtuous ascetics and brahmins who realize for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world so for me that's enormous to know that there are people who've walked this path there are people worthy of respect you know we don't just have to have like i don't know football players on our wall or rock gods or something but there are really people that have done something very special very remarkable in this world today <clears throat> that's all of us as well right because we're walking on the path so that is how a good person holds views as a good person i think i'll finish this little bit and uh I don't know, maybe I'll go to the comments because this is about uh, what we've just said. So this is related to the speech. I have a little fortune cookie note on my refrigerator. Do not speak unless it improves upon the silence. I like that. Yes, I've heard that somewhere before. It may be an Ajahn Brahm not so original or it may be an Ajahn Brahm original, <laughs> but it's really good, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if that is really the case, it's very rare that we need to speak. And the Buddha actually said, you know, the best speak of all is, uh, well, of course, the silence, but otherwise talk on wanting little, talk on contentment, talk on the holy life, basically. Talk on practice. And then at some point in the practice, even that becomes a hindrance to going deeper. So, But it's very nice to use speech in a way that encourages us and rouses us to practice. Yeah certainly helps us not to speak too much huh <laughs> those three paragraphs are right speech right action and right view of the eightfold path indeed they are correct <laughs> and of course there's the uh the right view that is super mundane as well at least that's how it's translated which means the right view of the areas which is uh the real right view yeah, so actually it's only one part of right view that was uh, discussed here. So, and then the last little uh, part of this, I like this one very much. 
How does a good person give gifts as a good person? Here, a good person gives a gift carefully, gives it with their own hand, gives it showing respect, gives a valuable gift, gives it with the view that something will come of it. That means something good will come of it. That is how a good person gives gifts as a good person. So the something that will come of it should be the joy that comes as a result in your own heart. And that can come even while you're giving that gift, if you give it in the right way. And I thought about it last week, this giving with one's own hand and realized that this is something that happens every day in the monastery. Like the food is offered by people's own hands. So it's something very real, very immediate. It's like a connection that brings us joy. And uh, one of my guests staying here, she really likes to give and offer every single dish because it brings us so much happiness to touch each and every one, you know, and the, and the more she's got going through the giving, the more happy she becomes, <laughs> which is really beautiful. You know, when, when you've got that connection between the thing offered and the person receiving, it's something very connecting, I think. Yeah. And also we had this lovely dana, uh, a few days ago, we had like three Sri Lankan families came. It was the biggest one we've ever had. So it's like took photos, show it looks like a real vihara. <laughs> and the two little boys, one of them was having his sixth birthday and the other one was five. They were best friends since six months old. They were gorgeous together, absolutely gorgeous. And I came down the stairs and apparently in Sri Lanka, like they call monks and nuns sadhu when little people call them sadhu because it's an easier word than the Sri Lankan word for monastic. So when I came down, they were like, Ari, mommy, mommy, are you sadhu, 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 sadhu? <laughs> Practically jumping up and down. <laughs> they don't care if I'm white and if I'm female, they just say, real sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> And then they had to come in and offer, you know, with their own hands. They wanted to touch everything and they did it really beautifully. It was so, so touching. <laughs> yeah, so it gave them a lot of happiness. And I think that might be partly where this is coming from, you know, thinking about that culture in ancient days. So that good person, thus possessed of good qualities, who thus associates as a good person, decides, counsels, speaks, acts, holds views, and gives gifts as a good person on the dissolution of the body after death is reborn in the destination of good people. And what is the destination of good people? It is greatness among the devas or the human beings. Hmm. So this is a good realm to be born into. <laughs> so we must be good people, right? We just have to see that we keep on uh, building on the good karma that's brought us here don't take it for granted but keep on making good causes for future rebirth but ideally future non-rebirth <laughs> no future birth at all so yeah if you are going to have a rebirth if, it, if you think it's inevitable which it might not be then at least we try to improve on what we have by um you know not taking for granted all the blessings in our lives, all the privileges, the responsibilities that we have, but we use them for the good of others. And remember that that includes the good of yourself. So it's not necessarily that the more you do, the better. This is something we can fall into, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's like how we do it and knowing the right measure, knowing when to stop. And I say this as much for myself as anyone else, you know. I mean, one thing I do do is always building retreat time and I'm having two week retreat from the 1st to the 15th of Feb, complete solitude with two other guests who will just cook quietly and take it in turns, but we'll just sit quietly and listen to talks, that's it. And then every summer, every rains basically, the rains in, in the other, the uh, eastern part of the world, I take my three months retreat and I don't talk <laughs> except to my teacher, you know, and sometimes at lunchtime, someone might say hello. So I'm not like, <clears throat> don't you say hello to me. But I might say hello back. But otherwise, I really don't want to disturb the silence and degenerate the silence. Kaz is nodding because she's been there many, many years. And I don't think we ever really spoke actually until this year. Um, is that right? I think it was only this year after my long retreat that Kaz and I spoke a little bit. Yeah. So we do take the practice seriously. It's a wonderful opportunity to have to be in the forest and the huts with all the support just 
available there. So that is the chapter on the good and the bad person. And uh, we probably do have time to go through some more, but I would like to uh, just read through the comments that are here and then invite any discussion. So I find the teachings on karma an incredible relief. How beautiful is it that actions fruit in good consequences from good intentions and vice versa? How much better is that than any other possibility? Yeah, <laughs> it's just right, isn't it? It just makes sense. It's like very, very pleasing. I can't imagine any other thing making sense. You know, you have to really twist and convolute life, you know, in order to kind of find a way out of that. I think it's 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 really wonderful. Yeah. It sounds kind of trivial, but I remember even as a small child, I used to have these like little, I don't know, little moments when I'd noticed that I'd had a bad thought and then I'd trip up or something like that. I don't know. I suppose most of us have that, right? Or, or when I first started shaving my head as a nun, you have to be really careful because I use an open blade. I don't use one of those safety things. Otherwise, the hair won't come off. It clogs it up because I got a lot, actually. I got quite a lot of hair. And... um and I noticed that if I lost my mindfulness, especially if I had a negative thought or even just like a kind of slightly grumpy thought, I'd catch myself. <laughs> you know, just because we're not being mindful, being a bit rough, not quite soft enough. Uh, and it's so lovely when you see, you know, people being really mindful and the care and the gentleness they use toward everything they do. <laughs> this is the Goldilocks zone. I don't know what that means, but I guess it means not so bad and not too much good. That's the reference to the human realm. <laughs> okay. But why Goldilocks? I don't quite understand that one. But why's that? Anyone know? And Emily says, I'm a beekeeper. Always need to be mindful and happy out there. I always get stung if I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Having to put out really nice, safe, harmless vibes to the bees, I guess. Oh. I unmuted Bill because he was um, raising a hand. The Goldilocks, you know, the porridge. Yeah. This porridge is too hot. This porridge is too cold. This porridge is just right. Okay. The middle. Is that what um, Goldilocks used to say? That it's not hot enough or cold this enough? Bed, this bed is too hard this bed is too soft this bed hey. is too oh, okay. The th right. with the three bears i see thank you for clarifying now i understand <laughs> uh, anyone else got comments or questions on this i guess you're all eager to get on to the next part because it's kind of the opposite of last week it's the same really oh okay oh niley or tamale actually <laughs> hi Hi, I just actually have a comment because um, when you said the offering of food, I just did um, instantly took me back to like, um, like my childhood, um, where in our culture, uh, when we are doing the Bodhi, Buddha Puja, um, I think most of us can remember like Manori, for example, um, all the flowers have been passed one by one. So you're not only offering one, you feel like you've offered thousands um and anything if you are having like a dana at home everyone goes around uh, letting whatever we are going to offer you let everyone touch it so that you have a personal feeling of you know you are offering it so just i just have had those wonderful memories uh, just thought i'll share it thank you yeah that's also really nice that you're demonstrating with those memories how it can bring joy so long afterwards as well how it's really memorable, maybe because it's not only that you are offering so many flowers, like you realized how many, it's the intention again and again and again, right? I remember my first teacher, Goenkaji, he used to say like, serving is so, so, so much more meritorious than giving a donation because with a donation, you give it once. Of course, you can plan for it, you can put a lot of intention into it, you can reflect on it, but when you serve, you're making a good volition every moment every moment that you're serving especially people that are meditating um you know all your care all your heart is going towards trying to help them progress in the dhamma and it's just enormous good karma like it makes you so happy if you care to really think about it 
and I guess that's why it relates as well to you know there are ascetics and Brahmins who have who are basically wise right that we're actually enabling people to to become wise you know another nice reflection that one of my first teachers told me is that when I serve the people on retreat always respect them they could be stream winners in the future you know and I think you know when you sort of think they could be stream winners you might initially think well I don't know maybe out of all those maybe like one might eventually in a few hundred lifetimes but actually it's maybe more probable that they all will because everybody's practicing right and as long as you keep practicing Bhikkhu Bodhi said I really love this what he said he said all you have to do two things you have to do to attain enlightenment start walking and continue that's it so you know people might think they've started and oh dear I went through a bad time I, I fell off the path you're going to come back to it because once you've heard these teachings you just can't forget it you just can't you know we might think it'll be forgotten but the seed is so strong and so powerful you know the karma of practicing the Dhamma is so enormous that you can't forget it you'll remember it in a future life maybe we were all like hermits or mystics in a past life <laughs> I'm sure many of us actually were right and maybe some of us have forgotten exactly what that was like but we're here again <laughs> so I just think if we got a life now where we can practice the Dhamma and we're still practicing the Dhamma then we're surely going to get another I mean hopefully not but if you have to get another it's going to be one way you can practice the Dhamma right <laughs> yeah uh what about if we give carefully the, but the person does not want to take maybe the word carefully means to look whether somebody is ready to take something that we would like to give hmm yeah that's an interesting one I think if they don't want to take it but you really have a good intention to give it it's still a good intention but it's true that the intention may be better when it's say an appropriate gift when it's given at an appropriate time given in the right way etc giving for the right reasons you know without expectation just because you want to give and maybe yes maybe you know that that person is really going to appreciate not to praise or thank you but just to really make good use of that and in a sense that's why you know the Buddha told his monastics don't you teach if people aren't receptive because it will be troublesome it will be a waste of time so you know only kind of give admonishment give instruction to people who are responsive who can take that without anger without retaliation because otherwise yeah it just falls on rocky soil or rocky floor you can't call it soil it just falls on the rocks and it can't take root so yeah it could mean many things and I think that's a really good one to explore because obviously there you know we've got to check that we don't um want a certain response from the person but certainly uh I mean I kind of think it's good to give everywhere I used to sort of think yeah it's better to give to some people than to others but now I kind of feel like anyone who asks I mean when I first went to India I was I had no money I had like 20 pounds a week to live on uh, which was it was a struggle even in those days it was like living on about not much more than most people in India really and um and I was so kind of stingy I would say not to give anything you know and to bargain to the last rupee or the last half a rupee and I did get like local prices or less perhaps <laughs> and later after practicing the Dhamma I really changed and when beggars would come and ask for stuff I'd just give them stuff I don't really care who they are it's like well you know I mean not always money but sometimes a banana or something you know if I could find something it's like let's just do it it feels much more open-hearted um so yeah but certainly if you're giving a big gift say to the Sangha or to anyone really check that people are really making use of it correctly um and that it's really going for for good same if you're giving to a charity you might want to check what that charity spend the money on right sometimes they're hanging about in big cars and the executives are going off on like cruises or whatever so yeah it's good to check mm -hmm. can non-monks attain enlightenment I hope so because I'm a non <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. You call them monks over there. I know you didn't mean that. It's a joke. But yes, yes. Um, it depends what stage you're talking about. I mean, I think it's kind of inevitable that they all will, 
because um, basically in the text, the only um, stage you can't supposedly attain as um, a lay person is the absolute final stage of full enlightenment, but you can attain it, but you'll die unless you enter the Sangha. Um, and that's because you simply have no reason to keep existing. There's no more greed, hate or delusion. So if there's no actual purpose for you to continue to exist, then then you won't. But if you join the Sangha, then it's like there's a vehicle whereby the qualities that you've de developed, like you, you have a vehicle to basically teach and to be of benefit to the world. So this is the idea. But in the suttas, there are examples of people who are anagamis. So it means no more greed, no more aversion. That's pretty huge. No more lust, right? And they live almost like monastics. They live so, so simply. They don't even work for money. They just put something outside and say, anybody needs this, just leave some rice in return. And this was an actual case of someone called Gatikara, who used to make pots. And he had to look after his blind parents, so he couldn't ordain. So he used to do that instead and put out the pots that he'd made and say, if you wish, just leave some grain or rice, whatever you want. And he practiced, you know, and the Buddha trusted him so much that the Buddha would come to his house and take food, even if um, he wasn't there to explicitly offer it. He knew he had an open invitation. They had such a strong bond of trust. And in the suttas, it then talks about how actually Gatikara was one of uh, the previous lives of the Buddha. One, in one of his previous lives, he was a person called Jyotipala, and they were actually really close friends. So, so he became an anagami and the Buddha became the Buddha. And then, and then apparently Gatikara, who was still in another realm, came down to congratulate the Buddha. He said, I'm your old friend. You were Jyotipala, I was Gatikara. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> you, you kind of did it. But the thing is, Gatikara would also then just uh, not come back and he would attain you know, the final enlightenment in, the, uh, in that realm. I forget what they call it, the pure abodes or something. Um, yeah, so, so yes, you can, but it's harder because there's more attachment. And you'll see that if you have the aspiration to go forth, you'll find that things come up that stop you doing it. And, you know, some people say they really want to do it. And then they say, but I can't give up my hair. And it's like, hey, that's only the very first step. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, that's the easy bit. <laughs> I can promise it's easy. I can just get some scissors and I can, you know, I can offer it tonight to anyone here. So <laughs> they're laughing. But one of them doesn't have any anyway. So, But he did it, you see. He actually did it also for six months. So, yeah. And even if you do it for a short time, it's a huge boost on the path, like to have made that renunciation, to have actually gone through those steps. I did it also the first time before I knew I could do it long term because I still had to finish the final year of my degree. I knew I was going back to ordain. But I thought, you know, no matter what happens, I'll know that I made that really strong comer so that any other opportunity that arrives in future will be easy for me. And my best friend at the time, my best dumbest sister friend, um, I've got a few best friends, um, like really, really close. And um, she um, also wanted to ordain and uh, things happened in her life to take things a different way. But she still came to Burma while I was there and she ordained for two weeks with her then hobby, actually. Uh, and they both did for two weeks. And it still felt really important because for them it was like something very sacred that they wanted to do and they really would have done, you know, had things been slightly different in this lifetime. Um, and I do believe that that gives them enormous strength in future lives because it ultimately you have to give up everything, right? I mean, we're not just talking about our hair, we're not just talking about our name, we're talking about anything that we think we own as in our whole body and mind phenomena. You know, we can say our body is not ourself if we can give up our hair and, I don't know, look kind of weird when we walk down the street, etc. And not really get too upset if we get ill, etc. But, you know, the idea that our feelings are not ours or that our, even this part of us that knows what's happening is not ours, that's really scary. Our will, our choice is not ours. It's conditioned. It's entirely programmed. That's like really scary. I remember even having, you know, been around these teachings for probably a long time before I met Ajahn Brown. It would have been about already 18 years. And then he gave this talk, the first one of the first I heard where he just really plugged on that and plugged about cessation, everything ceasing. 
And I just became extremely like anxious, anxiety going right through my body. And I was really quite blown away. It's like, why am I so anxious? <laughs> and he always says it's a good sign because it's some attachment that you have being threatened. So it's actually a good sign. All right, now we have Susie. Can we ask you to unmute? Yes. Uh, hi. Actually, I want to ask um, about that experience a little more because I do find myself, um, especially nowadays, sometimes when my practice deepens, that anxiety can be so strong. And <laughs> I am currently going through like a very, very strong um, bout of this um, anxiety. I know it's a little off topic, but I'd be very curious to know how you um, dealt with that. Right. No, it's not off topic. It's right on topic for Dhamma practice. So absolutely welcome. This is the whole purpose of this time we have together. This is just to get us going, you know. <laughs> we shouldn't be rigidly attached to the content there. Um, so yeah, I would say it's uh, it's a natural part of the process um so it's not something to be worried or concerned about as Ajahn says it's a good sign because you're going a bit deeper and so the anxiety will come up so I would say when it comes up rather than fall into the kind of old habit pattern of wanting to get past it get beyond it um you know wanting to go deeper go through it etc which is actually a subtle aversion to the anxiety itself i would say try to make the anxiety the center of your practice at that time you're not going to get that much deeper right now anyway you've already you're already on the edge of what the sense of self can take at this time so be gentle with yourself and maybe turn to a more compassionate practice at that time and open to the anxiety just allow it to be there say okay anxiety I know you that's okay you've come to see me you know I'm here for you you can stay as long as you want I'm just going to relax I'm just going to relax with you I'm just going to open to you come in come in you know just let it in don't stay with it for too long if it's really strong you know if it's really really strong you might open your eyes and just touch the floor look around you okay I'm safe you know I'm just sitting on my cushion and you know and just give yourself a little break and and maybe just go into it gradually slowly just for a few moments but make sure you have the right attitude I would say that's the most important thing and after a while your mind will start to not worry so much about it it will lose its power over you because you're not feeding it you're not making it a big deal it's actually a little puppy dog it's not actually a monster you know all of those things so if you can see it like this little puppy dog it's come just to get a bit of petting <laughs> you give it a little bit of petting and eventually it'll just settle down so yeah it's a natural part of the process don't push past it because we don't want to enter these things too soon into deep states of meditation that's not the goal the goal is to have an integrated practice the whole eightfold path and for us to have a very soft mind when we go in so i'm going to be speaking about that a lot tomorrow in the online well it's in person and online retreat about because there are some suttas also that talk about you can get into unification through force through kind of you know suppression and reigning in defilements but your mind's not soft enough to really give the rise to the wisdom that that should be a result of that so yeah take it as a good sign and just be really gentle with it and uh yeah okay give, thank give you so much time. yeah <laughs> there's another question in the box shall i go for it i'm not quite sure i know the answer uh if you have to give up all the wanting in order to get enlightenment <laughs> how can you continue practicing giving for others without attachment as well <laughs> yeah the reason I'm laughing is just the you know how hard it is to talk about these things right you're talking about getting enlightenment but it's not a thing to get that's the thing so it's not like we have to do something to get something this is how we think right because this is the way it works in the world but this is something totally different it's not that we have to give up it's more that wisdom tells us that wanting is suffering so once the wisdom shows us that then the letting go is natural so you don't actually feel you're giving anything up except suffering and the more you give up suffering the more you are brave enough to keep giving up suffering and then you know once you've given that up completely you could call that enlightenment 
So once you've given up suffering, there is no you that wants to practice giving. So it's more that the sense of self has disappeared. I mean, this is what I understand. I'm not fully enlightened, so I don't really know, right? But this is what I understand from my teachers and from the text is that this right intention to give, to be kind, to be generous, to serve is just a natural part of the process. It's all there is left to do. It's just the way wisdom responds to suffering. It, it responds with compassion, you know, because you've seen suffering to its very depth and you have just immense compassion for everyone else that you can see is still stuck. And imagine, I mean, even for me, I feel that compassion when I know that, you know, people are struggling and I, I've got maybe a little something to share, or at least discuss. But imagine if you've actually seen through the sense of self and you can see how everybody else's delusion of a self is making them suffer and they don't have to be suffering, you know, it's just a delusion. Then, of course, all you want to do is show them that, isn't it? So, but it's not coming from you want to do it. I think it's, it's just a natural process that happens. There's no other reason for you to continue being alive. And so, you know, in the teachers that I have faith in as enlightened, or at least nearly all the way, um, who knows quite how close, they do just give. And it's a really selfless kind of giving without any attachment whatsoever, because, I mean, they understand it's all just a process. All they can do is, you know, try to put some causes in place for other people. They know the importance of hearing the Dhamma. So they enable other people to hear the Dhamma. But they also know that what people do with that is up to their own karma. It's not up to the teacher. So I've never, ever felt from my teachers that they're kind of pushing me to understand something or kind of getting frustrated because I'm so slow. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> given up on me a long time ago but they don't because they just know that it's all going to come together and it's so beautiful when teachers have that trust because we don't know because we kind of wanted to happen in our schedule and we might think it should have already happened or whatever but they know it's just inevitable at some point it's just we don't know when right so i hope that makes some sense um a good person doesn't counsel one's own, for one's own affliction does it also mean they don't believe one's own unskillful thoughts yeah great great insight <laughs> could well do couldn't it because we cancel ourselves all the time don't we and tell ourselves hey be better come on shape up hurry up you should be inspiring you're a monk you're a nun <laughs> that's not really cancelling for one's own uh, freedom from suffering yeah it's definitely cancelling for one's own affliction come on work harder do more <laughs> stay up till midnight and get the work done yeah yes it definitely could be thank you for that i love that when we ponder on these things more ideas come up yeah so we have maybe another 10 minutes i'm not sure it's maybe best to just have some more discussion at this point than start a whole other passage i don't know if people do have more practice questions or general questions related or unrelated, I'd be happy to hear. <clears throat> I did want to ask you a question though, as well, which was around that. Um, so yeah, what does it mean to you? Here, a good person does not counsel for their own affliction or for the affliction of others. What does that actually mean? Does anyone know or have an idea or have an example? All right, I'll give you a moment and I'll go to the comment. I look really old now, taking off, I've got the glasses and got the grey strip. <laughs> Fake wisdom, fake wisdom. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, did Olivia also have a hand up? Can we come to you? Because I don't think you've spoken here before and then we come to Darren. Can you unmute Olivia? I'm just searching, searching Olivia. Olivia. Oh, yeah, okay. Hi, um, 
Yeah, I was just thinking um, that was really interesting what was just said. And so it's like the dana is, is like it provides the path, like for the condition, in order for the conditioning to improve, then all of the eightfold path and everything provides like the structure to like change the conditioning into being really good yes yes yeah 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 Yeah, absolutely it change it gives the structure it gives the foundation it gives the path right to change the conditioning and then it's like the conditioning becomes so changed that we become the path like we just become the path manifesting so that you know in somebody who's like that deeply aligned to the path they actually are the path and so whatever they speak is right speech whatever they do is right action you know their view their whole perception perspective on life is right view it's just incredible so there's no body there anymore it's just the path just happens yeah yeah there's this lovely quote in the Visuddhi Magga that Ajahn Brahm's really fond of it says the path is but no traveler on it is seen so then he says, it's like, if you're traveling the path, then it's not really the path because there's an I doing it. But after a while, there's the path takes over and then the I disappears. It's like we substitute this delusion of self for the path. <laughs> Sounds good, huh? <laughs> but we still resist it. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, very nice. I like that. It seemed like an inspiration that came to you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Can we go to Darren? Yeah, and then I'm I will unmute Darren now. Box, just because I don't want to skip anyone's comments and questions. Thank you. I'm uh, venerable, sorry. Um, just thinking um, about the council and um, the start of my year, I think coming off of the three day retreat up in Sheffield. And on, on New Year's Eve, we were talking about um, one thing to let go of and one thing to welcome in and I was my was let go of um, being really hard self-critic and judging and just welcoming in loving kindness and compassion to walk towards myself and I've just held that every every single day um, since then and and what I've been doing is noticing um, and having that awareness that I am criticizing myself or I'm being hard on myself and this should come up. And then I'm just trying to then sit on the bank, let the stream, let the river run by um, and just observe the feelings and then just give it, counteract it with loving kindness and compassion um, and trying to give that, I think, wholesome counselling and I'm also noticing it when maybe an email that's come in from people um, has been a bit challenging and triggered um, or somebody said something and trying to pause and not react to it and just observing my reactions and then um, including them in my uh, meta meditation um, to try and spread that karma and when I do that then I don't think they change I change because it's my perception has changed of them um and I just and just let it go um and it's definitely a daily practice um for sure um very skillful yeah first of all noticing it's amazing isn't it how making a strong intention like that you know if it kind of it's like bringing it up to the forefront of your mind. So because you've made that really strong intention, you can now notice whenever you are coming from a place of that's not kind on yourself, whenever you are saying, I shouldn't be this way, or, you know, I reacted again or whatever, or towards others. And um, yeah, because that intention's so strong, it's kind of conditioning you to, yeah, to follow that intention of developing more loving kindness. So it sounds really skillful because you're not bypassing the feelings that come up initially and saying you know oh instead of anger I should feel meta you're just including all those you know more afflictive emotions in the sense that cause you suffering you're including that as your meta object that's really fantastic yeah beautiful so you become your own wise counselor this is the Buddha's intention to make everyone their own teacher in a sense right Mm -hmm. one one day at a time I think one day at a time yeah well you are doing it so well done all right, I'm going to come to the um, comments in the box. I think this is again asking about monastic life as opposed to 
householder's life. And I mean, just to say that it's not sometimes for some people, for most people, <laughs> householder's life might be more suitable. Um, so it's not that, you know, for everybody, monastic life's the answer necessarily. And monastic life isn't just one thing. It can be like a deep opportunity to practice and it can also be incredibly challenging and actually a very heavy kind of life of service. I mean, heavy and, you know, it's good stuff, but it can be quite a challenge as well. So it's not that by being a monastic, you necessarily always have many more options to practice, but there are distinct differences in the qualities you're developing. And the main characteristic of monastic life is the strength of the renunciation, the letting go. So anyway, here you're asking, I'm curious to hear from others how hard it is to practice as a householder. And I guess it says, and as a monastic, as a householder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, verses. Okay, there's this thingy comes up across my comment. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know being married with kids, peace and serenity seem far off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, they can seem far off. <laughs> People are laughing in this room. Maybe I'm trying to say, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, because I haven't been married with kids, but I did have an instinct that it might not be quite for me. <laughs> I haven't regretted it either. Um, so I can't lie. But I, I mean... These things can seem far off, but sometimes because we think they are, we make them far away. You know, we don't allow ourselves to feel peace and serenity because we can't put down uh, the troubles of the day. And that's the same for anybody. You know, it's how the mind holds on to things and carries them into our practice or carries them into the night so that we don't sleep or whatever else, you know. So, yeah, sure, it's complicated because you're taking care of so many more candors than just your own five, you know. <laughs> Um, but you're in that situation. If you're in that situation, you can also make use of it to develop enormous qualities, enormous strength. You know, you can make that your practice. The people around you are the ones that you can practice your meta with, and they're the ones that are going to trigger you the most as well. In community as a monastic, you would have people triggering you all the time. I mean, I've been really lucky so far that I'm mostly around really good people who hardly trigger me. I mean, sometimes, though, it's tough and we have situations that are actually, I would say, bordering on abuse, if not abuse. In fact, sometimes I don't use the word, but my teacher uses the word. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, you know, you're not escaping that um, as a monastic necessarily. You might have very tough situations you have to deal with, and especially, you know, being kind of having compassion as your ideal and being very open to different kinds of people, not having the choice about who you live with is actually incredibly tough, right? And you're more exposed to kind of potential um, difficulties, even dangers as a monastic sometimes if you're not protected by a big sangha. So you can't really compare lay life with monastic life. You can maybe compare one person's life with one other person's life, perhaps, but even that, I don't know that it's helpful because we've got what we've got in front of us. And for some reason, we've made that comma. It's much more conducive, I think, to ask what's the best use I can make of the situation I'm in than sort of thinking it would be different otherwise. Because quite often, I think we meet the same patterns of our mind no matter what situation we're in. You know, there's certain things that are kind of very sticky and they're going to come up wherever you go. <laughs> you might change a few things. It's like Ajahn Ram says, you're just changing one type of suffering for another. Some aspects might get easy, but other ones will get more difficult. So, you know, we have our commitments. We've made our commitments. Luckily, I've committed to monastic life. Otherwise, I would have given up so many times. <laughs> oh, it's nice to see someone there. Probably a member of your family, Bill. That's awesome. Hi. <laughs> two. Two members. Yay. <laughs> no? Speak. Speak. <laughs> Hi. This is number two. This is number two. Oh, yeah. hello. That's nice yeah, that you came to say hi. Hi. Oh. hi. <laughs> so isn't you? that wonderful? I'm sure you develop massive amounts of love and kindness being a father. Uh, patience. Patience, yeah. Patience. Uh, patience. But isn't that well part of it? Deep. Uh, so, yeah, that's good. And then Rob would say it's 100% harder to practice in a family household, not so much harder if you're single and live on your own. 
Well, have you practiced in a monastery? How can you say that? Unless you've had both. 100% harder to practice in a family household. Yeah, I mean, figures, we don't know figures. Sorry, I'm going to be just very, <laughs> very direct. <laughs> we can't quantify that we don't know you might have some days where it's so much easier you know sometimes people think coming to a monastery is going to be a lot of freedom a lot of peace there is no distraction from your issues there's no distraction you know I can't just say right I have four days off or even one day off because I got guests coming I can't just say right I'm going out for a cup of coffee even though it's a very wholesome thing to do I haven't got the money in my hand you know <laughs> but of course those things do support you when you're ready for that kind of practice. Um, I agree that having a lot of busyness in the house might make it hard to actually meditate. And maybe that's what you mean by practice. You know, it might not be so easy to have that time, but then you do, you can go to groups. You can join meditation groups. You can try to have an hour here and there or even five minutes here and there. So I'm not trying to be unsympathetic here, but um, I'm just kind of calling out how we think it's going to be easier in a different situation, but really we're imagining it. We can't know unless we're in it. So I would say just try to find ways to bring more practice opportunities into your family situation. Sometimes, of course, it might be tempting to be single and live on your own. And that's OK. You know, sometimes relationships don't work out. Sometimes we are really struggling and, you know, we need to make a change. So that is OK. It's not that you failed. It's just that you want to prioritize more meditation time, for example. But see if you can do the best you can with what you have, first of all. I suddenly have nine new messages and it's already um, eight o'clock. <laughs> so uh, I'll just read through. Ajahn Brown talks about single person suffering and married person suffering. There's always suffering. They just change their shape. Someone else says, I have the house to myself most of the time and it helps with the practice. But having to work a high pressure job takes a toll. I wake up at five and meditate, then my mind's fresh. But after work, it's harder. Yes, it's harder. But if not much commitments, you can create good conditions. Yes, but sometimes the conditions that might help us are maybe not the ones we think are going to be the ones. We never know for sure. I have to say that Ajahn Ram Sunday tells me you can give a you can get enlightened giving a talk and it's true there are cases where it happens. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, contentment is very important in every situation. Yeah, look, I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but you also don't know how difficult my life is. I don't say. Because this is not a um, monastic life that I'm entering with a framework. This is not a situation the way it is for monks, where they go to monasteries that are established and they can let go. Here we're actually, it's kind of, what do you call it? It's activism. It's like I'm working in systems of discrimination to establish something for which there's no support structure. So when you ask me what I do in terms of admin, it's like everything. It's educating people as to why they even need to be bikunis. It's like having to be good at absolutely every task in front of me. You know, it's having to organize for my teacher to come over just to kind of show people that, hey, you know, bikunis have support. Come and listen to the teachings. We're going to provide something of, of benefit to you. You know, this is not a given for bikunis. In fact, we're seen as controversial and a potential source of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, to the, to the established sangha. So it's really not easy. Um, <laughs> what I don't understand is how hard it is to be a monastic. To me, the monastic life looks so easy. So the only way to know anybody else's life is to try it. So I've been a lay person too, but not married with children, not in this life, but that's only one life. And everybody's monastic life is different, as I say. And it's really true. Yeah. Um, other people's lives look easy. And and monks' lives are quite much easier, much easier. Like in Perth, for example, the monks have to work two hours, four times a week. And most of it's like sweeping or tidying the books or something like that. I mean, yeah, that's privilege. That's really privilege. I've had that too. I've had similar. I've had a lifestyle as a monastic where I could meditate all day and night if I wanted, but it wasn't easy conditions I mean there were mosquitoes everywhere I had to sleep on a hard floor there was like no electricity I mean it was Burma right so it was hot I had a sweat rash from like my neck down to my ankles literally 
um it was tough physically but it was fantastic for meditation so it was a blessing but that was very impermanent because for bikinis as soon as you leave one place there is no structure available in the society where you can go and say i'm a non can i come in no there's nothing uh okay monastics have monastic suffering yeah i mean basically the reason it's suffering as a monastic i'm talking about the superficial ones you're facing the deeper defilements that do not want to go so mara or the defilements will do everything not to go so this is the real work you know in lay life you can distract yourself you can have fun you can kind of you know have lots of entertainments and etc cetera, etc cetera. but in monastic life it's like everything depends on you practicing and the practice kind of working and um you face your inner struggles your inner demons so to speak you know there's no way out um anyway that's a whole other talk isn't it and i also think it's very powerful because of that <laughs> if it was easy everybody would be doing it that's another kind of proof that it's not <laughs> okay uh good so somewhere that's going in you don't choose who you live with that seems harder to me and it also changes who is there at any time yeah that's right it's it really really changes things depending on who you're with especially if you're not in a big sangha whereby you don't actually spend much time with the guests um this is your company so you have to get on with all kinds of people like i say mostly really wonderful amazing people so i'm very lucky in that way but um, you don't have your own life. I think that's what it is. You don't have your own, you don't have control over your life in any way, in any way. So that's one of the things. That's why you do it, because you try it as a lay person and you realize, oh, I can go a certain depth, but then I can still control it. If I don't like the weather here, I can travel there. If I don't like the people here, I can go over there. If I don't like this partner, I get a new partner. I know it's not that easy. Um, but in monastic life, you actually purposely deciding to put yourself in a situation where you don't have control so come to the monastery for a few days there's not that much control there's a bit I notice how in monasteries the breakfast get more elaborate every day so there is some sort of <laughs> or the amount of chocolate and cheese increases gradually <laughs> because there's no other outlet right <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny anyway i think i should wind up because we've gone a little bit over time and i know that most of you might have to go and also that shell is here patiently waiting in the background to give her heartfelt little dana talk so i will invite you are you going to come and do it on here she can just sit right next to me yay come this is shell the good shell hi <laughs> come right up sitting on your cushion this is exciting mm -hmm. very privileged um so i just wanted to oh sorry I'm my robes. Robes. <laughs> come, come, come. Yeah. venerable said that i give a really nice down talk but i actually have it written down so it's not pretty ad lived um <laughs> but just wanted to thank venerable very much for this evening uh, and sharing the teachings and her experience um spending time with her here just shows me how hard she does work. So it's not that easy at all to be a bikini. It's more than a full-time job. But... <laughs> <laughs> About five, actually. <laughs> yeah. So on that note, um, Venerable Chanda and the Anacampa Bikini Project um, offers these sessions through the spirit of Dana, and they're freely given to us. So in return, um, we can offer Dana to support Venerable Chanda and the Sangha in lots of different ways. Um, so we are really supporting her day to day life here at the Vihara. Um, so you can offer Dana in many different forms. Uh, the first one being uh, at the moment, we've got a list of items needed. Um, I'll post the links in the chat. Yeah. Um, so we do have a list there of things that we need at the Vihara. You could offer to um, uh, do the weekly shopping or, or shopping order. Um, <laughs> you could order also if you're not close by uh, ordering hot meal deliveries um, also veg boxes gift cards and checking the list as I just said earlier um, 
you can also join some WhatsApp groups that we have to support Venerable Chanda. So there's two at the moment, one that's supporting uh, when Venerable Chanda needs volunteers and the Sangha, uh, and one when Venerable Chanda and the Sangha uh, need support with food dana as well. So please drop us an email at teamanicamperproject.org about that. Um, also, if you have your time, uh, it doesn't have to be giving or monetary giving. Um, please do drop us an email um, to come and join us at the Vahara and to support Venerable Chanda and the Sangha. <laughs> <laughs> and also volunteering things like co-hosting calls as well and supporting oh, yeah. the Sangha with um, any admin and things that Venerable needs help with. Um, you're also able to donate monetarily um, to the Anicampa Bukuni project and that's via the website. You can either do a one-off payment or even a standing order for regular payments too. And that could just be something as little as the cost of a coffee once a week. Um, so yeah, I'm just checking that I've got everything. Um, so if Benoit Chanda wants to add anything more that she may and the She's very cool, isn't she? It's really great. Bit addicted to cheese at the moment. We had a very nice cheese spread this evening. Are you trying to hint that there should be some more? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it's very lovely and very well provided for. But the reason I say and the Sangha, it's not because I actually have other Sangha members here yet, but actually because I'm having a two week retreat soon. Where at the end of my retreat, my ordination sisters are arriving from Perth. So there will actually be two bikinis here, which is very exciting. So sometimes I say the Sangha yet to come because we do use the word Sangha to mean monastics. That's the way it's understood across Asia um, because they're worthy of offerings, worthy of respect. And uh, generally that's understood in Buddhist cultures to mean monastic Sangha. Um, but of course the whole community also benefit. We have to feed all of us. And so, um, so that's really good. But yes, there's actually going to be another bikini here with me uh very soon so hopefully i'll get her to come and do some sitters as well so uh i guess that's the last sitter class then for the next few weeks hopefully the next ones are up online already on the website to show you when they are and tomorrow there's the online day retreat for oxford insight i don't know if there's still places to join online maybe otherwise i'll see some of them there yeah so there's a few more places so I'll see some of you there, I'm sure. So please take care. Thank you for staying the extra minutes. And uh, yeah, lovely to see you all, particularly the people I haven't seen. Linda's huge smile and Tao, Kalea as well, and all of you. But yeah, really, really lovely to see you again. <laughs> take care. And shall we unmute you? You can all wave goodbye there. <laughs>